Jackie Wilson Charlock, and it is my pleasure this morning to introduce you all to Meredith Pyle. Let me read just a little bit about her. Meredith Pyle is a Los Angeles-based professional singer, teacher, actress, and vocal contractor. Originally from Houston, Texas, she received her master's in music theater performance from Oklahoma City University's prestigious musical theater program. After 10 years, Meredith now calls LA home, where she works primarily as a SAG AFTRA session singer for film and television projects. She can be seen or heard on dozens of projects such as Hocus Pocus 2, Doctor Strange, Frozen 2, and a personal favorite, belting out memory in full cat's makeup on The Ellen Show. Currently, Meredith serves on the voice faculty at both USC and Pepperdine University and works extensively as a vocal coach for Harvard Westlake School. She is an active member of NATS and participated in the 2021 NATS intern program. She both presented and performed at the National NATS Conference this summer in Chicago and now adjudicates and serves on the board of the NATS National Musical Music Theater Competition, which will honor her mentor, Dr. Florence Birdwell, in 2024. It is my pleasure to welcome to the stage Meredith Pyle. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, so thank you, hopefully, some of you online for tuning in. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm here speaking dir today directly because of this organization. Um, a couple of years ago, I received the incredible opportunity um, to attend the NATS intern program, and it is because of that week in Georgia that this presentation even exists. Um, the NATS intern program was an amazing experience, and it was a very interesting one as well. I made lifelong friends, and I learned so much, um, but I, I don't know that I learned it in the way that I expected to. All throughout the week, for example, we the interns had to perform. Um, we performed in voice clinics for our mentor teachers in order to gain knowledge about their pedagogical concepts. What I found super interesting was how much I was singled out that week um, because they kept finding my performances shocking. They were floored by my bold choices and the flexibility and my ability to change things on a dime. I kept getting feedback from the mentors like, you're so special, or, oh, I could never do that, or even what you do, it cannot be taught. It's just something you're born with. And like I told them at the time, respectfully, I disagree. Because I wasn't always an unbridled performer without an embarrassment gene. I wasn't always someone who believed that they were capable of creating this unique take on a song. In fact, my entire undergrad was spent thinking that I wasn't creative, a lie that I had been told all my life growing up. And it really wasn't until grad school that things started to change for me when I met a teacher who would forever change my life. Not every voice teacher has a Wikipedia page, but mine did. Um, if you go to the Wikipedia page for Florence Birdwell, you'll see this quote from her student Kristen Chenoweth posted at the top. She not only taught me to sing technically, but taught me to sing from the soul about what a song actually means. Don't sing it if you can't mean it. Florence Birdwell was an incredible pedagogue. She first earned her reputation as a gifted singer and performer, and at the age of 21, she was invited to join the chorus of the Metropolitan Opera. She was also invited to audition for the role of Lori in the new movie musical, Oklahoma. Soon after, sadly, she suffered an injury and a throat condition that never allowed her to sing professionally again. Although she was heartbroken, she returned to Oklahoma discouraged and her teacher at the time reminded her that while she may not be able to perform again, she could talk. And so talking she did and teaching she did for 67 years. And at 86 years old, Florence Birdwell became my voice teacher. I'll never forget my first encounter with Birdwell. Um, before my time with her, I had been studying um, at Baylor University. 
and I had just earned my vocal performance degree. I came in for my first lesson at Oklahoma City University, go stars, and uh, I, uh, I remember she asked us to sing something we were super proud of. So I had just actually won Texoma Nats for this piece, <laughs> hilariously. I go in, I sing my piece. She looks right at me with that Cheshire cat-like grin on her face, stares straight into my soul, and she goes, oh, well that sure was pretty, but it will have no place in my studio. Yeah, I was pretty shocked. I think, um, I think I realized really quickly that this was not going to be what I thought it was going to be, and thank God for that. She wasn't interested in seeing a polished and perfectionistic performer. She demanded more. She noticed immediately that there was something inside of me that was hiding and scared and begging to come out. She wanted to unharness me because she wasn't just interested in making good singers. She was interested in making artists. And if you look at her students and you look at the performing careers that they've had, you'll see that her methods for creating artists, well, they worked. What followed after that lesson was three years of unpacking everything that I had learned about myself and performing and learning the, um, what I thought was important about music and changing that into learning the importance of words, learning the importance of imperfection, learning how to laugh at myself, and honestly, above all of that, that I was enough, flaws and all, and that our audiences want all of us in our performing. She wasn't just a voice teacher, she was a life teacher. Florence Birdwell sadly passed away in February of 2021, just before the intern program. And it had led me to a lot of important thinking about her tremendous impact and how much she changed her students' lives. How was she able to connect with a student and get to the core of who they really are? How was she able to cultivate and this authenticity and embolden their point of view so that they showed up with something unique to say? Throughout this presentation, I will share some of the core teaching philosophies of Dr. Birdwell, like the importance of communication and text and meaningful connection. I'll also hopefully share some, shed some light on the state of our students and why this work is so hard. And finally, we will all get up together and try some of the tools and ideas inspired by Birdwell in order to start employing them in your own studio. What I have encountered over the past few years of teaching is that many of our students are struggling with that same perfectionism and fear of failure that I had. Read this list. See anything familiar? I'm betting many of your studios look the same. Why are we seeing these things trending? Well, it's not in our heads. According to the National Institute of Health, nearly one in three teenagers from the ages of 13 to 18 will experience anxiety disorder. And that was a study in 2020. Before the pandemic, just saying. <laughs> Honestly, I could spend the entire presentation today on the research I did on this slide alone, but I will highlight just a few important statistics in order to build empathy and understanding be before embarking on this important work. First of all, we live in a culture of achievement. Kids are being told that how well they do in school is directly reflection on how they will do in life. Um, there is this great study by UCLA's um, Higher Education Research Institute that showed in incoming freshmen, and this is in 2016, 41% of them felt overwhelmed by all they had to achieve, compared to 18% in 1985. Students today are living in a world that simply feels scarier than it did before. Um, I keep having to update this presentation based on new statistics. Um, since Sandy Hook, there have been over 200 school shootings, averaging about five every month. And just in 2022, there were 51 school shootings that resulted in injuries or death. And that's the most in a single year. The rise in mental health issues and disorders I believe also is reflected through our incredible internet usage. 
Shocker, constant comparison has a hugely negative effect on a person's mental health. So um, social media studies are showing that they're more, you're more than twice as likely to have a mental health disorder if you're using the internet and you're using social media in that way. Um, I highly recommend, recommend a movie called The Social Dilemma. Um, there's a reason why the creators of these apps don't let their children use them. And I think it's easy to assume that this is an adolescent issue, but what I found really interesting is that it was being reflective in my fellow interns. I'm seeing this as a struggle in many adults as well. We as a society simply aren't as comfortable using our voices as we used to be. In her book, Freeing Shakespeare's Voice, Kristen Leaklater talks a lot about this. And this technological revolution that we're in has moved the primary form of communication from the oral tradition to the print, essentially from the stage to the page. Kristen talks about language becoming anemic by being increasingly removed from the sensorium to the cerebral. We're not using our bodies to communicate, we're using our brains. We're writing how we feel. We're not expressing how we feel. Another thing Link later talks about is being trained from birth not to be expressive. One of the mentor teachers at the intern program literally said to me, oh, I could never do that because of the way that I was raised. And I really empathized with that because I was raised in much of the same way. Many of us are taught growing up not to express ourselves because they have dramatic consequences. Conventional child rearing teaches things like children should be seen and not heard or be ladylike or men don't cry, right? I think we as a society are finally getting away from some of these oppressive attitudes, but so many of us and our students grew up with these lessons and mantras ringing in their ears. Finally, as we as adults live in a world where decorum demands that we suppress our emotions. It is simply deemed inappropriate to express our feelings openly, particularly in the workplace and in public spaces. So in order to compensate for that, what do we do? We go to our therapist's office, right? Where we talk about our feelings, or we journal about our feelings, or we go to Facebook and we rant about our feelings. Okay, Karen. Um, <laughs> But still, very rarely are we encouraged to actually express our feelings verbally and vocally. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all run out of here and go into the world expressing everything that we're feeling internally, but I do think that this helps us understand why there is this epidemic and why there is this disconnect between the world's approach to accessing emotions and what we are trying to achieve in the voice studio. So no, it's not just in your heads. There's real statistical evidence to show us why we're seeing these trends in our studios. And before we figure out how to help our students get emotionally connected in the studio, I'd like us to look at the point for emotional connectedness and the relationship between connectedness and communication. Particularly in the academic setting, I'm seeing us obsessed with teaching our students how to sing, which obviously is very important. But I, in my opinion, it is not what is most important. What is most important is why we sing. We're so struck on this, the intricacies of how that we often completely lose sight of the why. And in doing so, I think that we've really lost something. We've lost the artistry and we've lost the connection to ourselves and the connection to our audiences. Birdwell understood this. She said, when a student takes words and communicates those words with meaning to an audience, then that student has com communicated something far greater than just the sound of a human voice. That far greater thing, I think, is connection. Birdwell believed the greatest gift we have as singers over all other musicians is the gift of words. We get to use words and text to connect with our audience. And that connection part, that's the key. That's the why. It isn't enough to just dictate text. There has to be meaning behind it. Communication experts agree <laughs> that there is a direct correlation between communication and connection. Dr. Diane Austin says the voice is one of, if not the primary instrument of connection 
to one's innermost self and to others. And the, one of my other favorite things that I read in my research was from Dr. Stephen Stozny, who said, you can't communicate your way to a connection. You connect first, then your communication will be way more effective. Communication expert Bill Rosenthal says, good communicators connect on an intellectual one, a level, but great communi communicators connect on an emotional one. Essentially, communication is a result of connection. And we find and we build that connection through involving the audience emotionally. I really want you to think about this because as singers, our job is to tell stories, to communicate those stories through the words and the sounds that we sing. But it is not enough to have clear diction and present the text beautifully and eloquently. Lasting and transformational communication happens only when our audience is connecting with us emotionally. So how do we do it? <laughs> how do we teach students to build, be fully connected, emotionally communicative, performing artists? Well, first, and this is a big battle for some, we have to get them to care. We have to get them to realize the importance of this work in the first place. Context can be really helpful for this. One way I convince students that being connected is important is by reminding them that it is literally one of life's most important skills, like being able to do well in school because you know how to connect with your peers and your teachers, or being able to have relationships with your friends and your family uh, in order to land their dream job because they were able to connect in an interview. If none, none of that works, you can always just use romance. Works every time, <laughs> right? <laughs> it also starts with discovering what barriers might be in place that are keeping our students from being able to connect at all. For instance, your students can't connect if they're operating in their sy sympathetic nervous system, their fight or flight mode, right? Um, we're seeing a lot of this. We're seeing kind of uh, arms crossed. I'm seeing it in our voice clinics that we're having this weekend even. Um, be on the lookout for that because there's a good chance that you're, the student that you're working with is not even going to be able to hear you <laughs> if they're operating in that sympathetic n nervous system. They're gonna be um, unfocused. Their eyes might be darting. Um, they might not even be able to uh, look you in the eyes, right? Um, we know that Eye contact is important for building empathy. You might notice some rigidity in the armpits, a clenched jaw. Um, you may see rapid breathing, some, maybe they're getting sweaty. Some of these signs are just for you to be aware that, oh, this is not a time where learning can take place. Um, there's this great story by my friend Jillian Page, um, who wrote, who is the founder of Meisner and Music, and she basically talks about at Midwest Theater auditions, on stage they had these two rooms. One was an exit and one was a closet. They all day kept getting singers to come in and they'd be like, the, make sure you go to the, the room on the left, room on the left, room on the left. And um, one of the singers came in, they did their performance, and then they walked right into the closet. <laughs> Even though they had been saying, no, 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 that's a closet, they said it three times. That's a closet, that's a closet, that's a closet. And they just waved and smiled and walked right into the closet. And then of course, for the next three people, all they could think about was the kid in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> right? Bless. But it's just another reminder of our, our, our communication cannot take place if singers are so inside their own heads and inside their sympathetic nervous systems that they're not even able to hear. Okay? Um, teaching our students tools for overcoming their anxiety and understanding their nervous system is key to building honest connection. You can try having them take in their environment. You can try like outside of an audition room, for example. Um, Jillian Page talks about this. Um, harnessing their senses. What are they smelling? What are they hearing? What are they tasting? What are they, they um, feeling? And even if it's something negative, that being okay. Oh, I'm hearing another singer right before me sing my same song. That's making me feel upset. That's making me feel anxious. That's making me feel like my song won't be enough, right? Just allowing them that time to come into their bodies and come into their minds and into their spaces and letting them 
letting their emotions, whether they're positive or negative, be enough and be okay is how that we release the pressure and keep them from having power over us. Another thing we can do is we can start with things like tapping in the voice studio. Um, one thing I like to do is just put little fingertips on the top of my head. All of a sudden, I become very aware of my posture. I also, for brand new students, um, we start with humming exercises. Humming releases oxytocin. It, it literally helps us feel love and safe. So I'll start with exercises that allow them to get relaxed in the space. Another important strategy for building an environment to encourage not just safety, but bravery in the studio. I love this. I got this from my fellow intern, Dr. Lily Guerrero, um, from the intern program, is we can create spaces, spaces where we establish expectations and protocols, like these are the laws of this land. When you're in this space, things are different. Those outside rules, yeah, they don't apply here and recognizing that this may be the only space in their lives where they're allowed to act this way. Uh, I love to try to encourage positivity. I know that seems pretty cliche, but um, this was another thing that I got from therapy. A personal anecdote about my therapist. My very first day I walk in and I'm really saying a lot of negative things about myself. And so the assignment was to take home my, a journal and. Every time I said something bad about myself, I would write it down. And I brought it in the next time, and we took that negative journal, and we flipped the script. We created a positive version of it, or we found a silver lining in it. Um, I did this exercise with one of my students at the intern program, a neurodiverse student that I had who had really obsessively talked about things that were not working in her technique. Um, we used this, this exercise, she went home, she wrote down the things that were not working, and she came in the next time, and for instance, she did not like her e-vowel, right? She just hated her e-vowel. Um, but her o-vowel and her u-vowel were glorious. So we literally took that, that script and we made the right version on the right-hand side of the column. And the next uh, week that I saw her, the next day I saw her, I literally vocalized her on only her positive silver linings, and I don't think there was a dry eye in the room. It was just one of the most powerful moments. Um, she also was able to perform at the final recital, and she had never been able to perform before in a public space because she felt like even though she had this negative script, she was going to, it was okay that she was feeling those negative feelings, and she went into that space knowing that those negative feelings were still okay, and that going into it was a, a form of bravery. It was such an empower, a powerful moment. Um, I also love to uh, make sure that my students feel that they can trust me. I know this may seem obvious, but I'm seeing a lot of breaking of you know, confidentiality amongst students and teachers. Students are not gonna connect with you if they don't trust you. And I don't ask them to put themselves out there or be silly without doing it first. I show vulnerability by sharing personal anecdotes or shared experiences from my own life. I feel that can be a really effective way of building trust. I also really try to um, focus on mindfulness. And if you haven't read The Inner Game of Tennis, I highly recommend it. It's a great book. Um, basically, he talks about we learn best through encouragement and observation. Think of a child learning to walk. Thankfully, most of us learn to walk before our parents tell us how, <laughs> right? Having them focus, um, having our students focus on how they're feeling versus what they are hearing, because what we, the way we hear ourselves is a lie anyway. We've all recorded ourselves and gone, wait, no, that's not my voice. Also, building non-judgmental awareness is super important. It's talked a lot about in this book, Inner Game of Tennis. We have to let go of our judgment of the work, not necessarily of the errors, but of the judgment. It means simply seeing events or processes as they are and not adding anything to them. Observation journals are a great way um, to think about this. I'm really excited. Um, I just got hired by USC. And in my curriculum this semester, um, we, we're using Lynn Helding's observation journals. And I'm really thrilled to see this in practice. 
It's basically pra uh, prioritizing the process over the product. Also play, which we'll do here in a minute. I like to start with really weird noises. Uh, an animal sounds can be a super easy way of breaking the ice in this way. Um, spoken exercises, I like to start um, with a lot of speech-based exercises before non-scale or, or non-scale based, based exercises like sirens. I also try to assign rep that explores more out of the box interpretations. Um, my favorite exercise for this is one I got from OCU. I came in with a piece that I was struggling with vocally and they asked us to present it using three completely different characters than the one that we had originally thought of for this, for this piece. And in that, I actually found kind of my signature song by singing it from the point of view of a stalker instead of a, a, a normal love song. Uh, Noble Bobble is another great takeaway from OCU. Uh, Dr. David Herendine, the head of opera and music theater, would applaud any time a performer made a mistake because they were trying a new choice. Um, my students have gotten to love this and we all kind of like yell it out and celebrate it when it happens. Noble Bobble, woo woo! And I and pulled the interns um, from the intern program about what was one of their biggest takeaways and Noble Bobble was one of the top things on the list. Destigmatizing failure. I think we think of failure as, as maybe a bad thing, and I think it's a great thing because it leads us to discovering what does work. Some of our greatest innovators were great at failing. Ariana Huffington, Michael Jordan, even Oprah, huge fan of failure. I love this quote by uh, Winston Churchill. Success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Okay, so let's jump into some actionable tools for your studio. Florence Birdwell was famous for making us monologue a song before we sang a note. I'm talking ad nauseum. Three to four lessons of our semester were just monologuing the song. She would not let us sing a note until she believed us. For today, we're going to use the example of Sondheim's So Many People. Um, would anybody be willing to read aloud the, the lyrics that they see on the screen? Thanks, Joel. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. I said, the man for me must have a castle. A man of means he be, a man of fame. And then I met a man who had a penny without a penny to his name. I had to go and fall for so much less than what I had planned from all the magazines. I should be good at Awesome, thanks Joel. <laughs> um, Joel did a great job of kind of disguising this, but a lot of times when I have people do this, you'll notice that there's kind of some weird phrasing when we put in lyrics to a song in this way, in the stanzas kind of way. Also notice there is an absence of punctuation. So this is an exercise I like to do with my students where I make them take all of the spaces and all of the um, paragraphs out of the lyrics and write them in kind of a, a prose form, paragraph form, and then add punctuation that they feel brings logical meaning. So um, Joel, or would anybody else like to read it in this version instead? Anyone else? Yay, thank you so much. I said, the man for me must have a castle, a man of means to be, a man of fame. And then I met a man who had a penny, without a penny to his name. I had to go and fall for so much less than what I had planned from all the magazines. I should be good at store. What am I happy for? I guess the man needs more than me. Great job, thank you. Sorry, it looks like I left off of parentheses there. Um, but yes, you see already just the few little bits of punctuation markings change the meaning so much. 
Um, when I come to San Francisco, I'll show you how I apply this to the actual sheet music as well. But for day, today, we're just gonna move on. But basically, I take the students' monologues and I directly um, put in their choices of inflection, even taking away breaths, gasp, and connecting um, or adding lifts or adding breaths or pauses where they may not even be originally in the music. Um, this can be one incredible way of transforming a piece and making it entirely their own version of it. One of the most helpful tools I found in the studio, I actually adapted um, from an on-camera acting class I took my first year in LA by Leslie Kahn. The basic concept is it's the thought that counts, meaning rather than playing an emotion, instead focus on creating a thought that motivates and informs the line that follows in the script. This is a very effective way of bringing specificity to the work. My student Claire at Pepperdine last semester completely transformed her song, Nothing Short of Wonderful, from Dogfight with this exercise. I know it's small, <laughs> she has tiny writing, but hopefully you can see. Um, these are some of her notes from one of her very first lessons. You can probably tell that at this point she had already done her homework meaning she had read the script, she had completed her Udahagen nine questions worksheet, which should be in your handouts um, for those of you online. And it was beginning to start to shape her story. Some of her choices, she was finding emo emotional moments and shifts. Um, I mean, come on, we've got excitement, lowercase, and then excitement, all caps, right? <laughs> all great stuff, um, but it was lacking specificity. And that's something I'm seeing so much in this competition. I think I've written that on all of my <laughs> judging forms this weekend. Um, so at her next lesson, we found some more specificity by creating unique thoughts before every line. This is her final thought map for this piece. The text in green on the left indicates the thought that she created before the lyric on the right. You can see already that we've gone from excitement to and excitement to something way more specific simply by creating a unique thought before the line. Um, a lot of teachers use you know, action verbs, which I think can be really helpful, but in my experience, students um, really, this, this philosophy, this method, it, it translates to the student's thought process a lot easier. I feel with the action verbs process, they were a little stuck in it, they're like obsessing about what's the appropriate action verb instead of just thinking, wait, ju what just happened? Oh my gosh, I think I just got asked out. Oh my gosh, I did, oh my gosh, right? So we take the thought and then we directly take the same inflection and we put that on the lyric. In practice, that's how this worked, right? The next time I would try to have her say the thought and then sing the lyric with that same process. Then I had her record her thought on top of a piano track in a doll like garage band so that when she was practicing with her accompaniment and she was singing along with it, she was hearing her own thoughts in her own words in the background. Really effective way of getting our students to make specific choices really quickly. Okay, let's play. So, uh, those of you that are here, and if you feel willing, please come up onto stage. This is going to be our little workshop portion. Um, we're gonna take the screen up, and those of you online, hopefully you will get to observe a little bit. So, as you're coming up, make your way safely up onto the stage, uh, maybe up and over there, just because I think it might be a tight over here. Um, and as you're doing it, as you're finding your space, I want you to just be noticing how you, yourself, the human, the person that you were born with, <laughs> was, is walking into this space. So go around the room as you. Interact with each other as you. Making eye contact with those around you. Yeah, just find like a little bit of a circle. Great. Now I want you to walk around as if you were walking through fog. What does that do? You're walking through fog. Great. 
Now I want you to imagine that you're walking on thin ice. <laughs> How does that change your pacing? What does that do internally to your feelings inside of your heart rate? Great, now I want you to shift to walking through mud. What does mud make you feel? <laughs> do you like mud? Is mud fun? <laughs> does mud make you feel icky and gross? Great, now I want you to change from external things to internal things. Go back to neutral, walking around this space. Now walk around like you just landed your dream job. How do you interact with others when you've landed your dream job? Does that make you want to look at people in the eyes a little bit more? Does that make a change to your posture, to the pacing of your walk? Does it change the way that you lead, maybe from the hips or from the chest or from the head? Now I want you to try walking around as if you've got a terrible haircut. <laughs> Notice what that does. Notice if you um, are looking at people in the eyes anymore. Probably not. Notice how quickly you walk. Notice now your posture. Notice what that does to your pacing. Now walk around like you just got in a fight with your best friend. You just got in a fight with your best friend. Thank you. Yeah. Notice how that might be different from the terrible haircut. What's going on in the body when you got in a fight with a best friend? How does that change your pacing? Now imagine that you're wearing your favorite outfit. How does that make you feel in your skin? What does that do to your gestures? Great, awesome, thank you so much. Let's form a little circle and we're gonna do an exercise called Silly Dilly next. So um, first off, thank you all for being here. I guess I'll let me put my mask back on. Um, so this is a fun exercise that I love to do in the studio right when everybody's feeling a little bit <coughs> maybe nervous and they don't wanna try something new. So basically, I'm gonna make a crazy sound. I'm going to tap it. You're gonna take my crazy sound and then make a new one and then pass it to you. You're gonna take hers and create a new one and then pass it to you. Make sense? Is everybody kind of clear on how this goes? Okay. So I'll start. Oh. It wasn't reactive. It wasn't kind of 
coming from a place of what's going on with you? I'm going to connect with you really quick in this moment. Take what you're giving me and then just see what comes out, right? This exercise is encourages that. It encourages us to not plan, not get cerebral, but just feel and, and trust the impulse, okay? Great job. We're also going to do something, and probably many of you know about this, um, but it's the Opera Works cards. Mm -hmm. um, I love these Opera Works cards by Ann Balt, and um, I'm going to go around, and we're not going to have any lyric. We're just going to, on an awe, we are going to try to have an emotion based on the card that is in front of you, okay? So we'll start, I'll just do this tender one. So, maybe that was a tender, you know, octave vocal beat, okay? So we're gonna go around the room, all right? Let's try this one, all as a, as a group, shot. Like get fresh. 
frustrated or bite our fingernails. Like we're doing a lot of these things when we talk, but all of a sudden when we start performing, it becomes like this. And I think that it's okay to touch our bodies when we sing. I think it's okay to use our gestures more. And what I'll have them do is I'll have them do this um, right, like maybe two or three lessons before the performance. And a lot of times they steal them, right? They steal these gestures and they're like, gosh, I really love how touching my ring finger when I was talking about my, um, my breakup, how that actually like really made me feel like, oh, it's like the marriage that I'm no longer gonna have, right? Or how these like, you would think these weren't connections and yet they become them, okay? Um, last thing that we're gonna do is talking about the bond gestures. So um, I gave a presentation with Frank Ragsdale, my mentor teacher at the NAC National Conference. We're only gonna do a little snippet today. If you're in San Francisco, you'll get more of this when you have our in-person workshop. Um, but we're gonna just do a series of small gestures and see how that gesture affects the voice, okay? So we're gonna start with a Levon gesture called flick. So everybody try that for me. Exactly, like you're just flicking water. We're dealing with a lot of rain today, so we know what yeah. that feels like. Flicking water off of our hands. Um, let's do the exercise, Alleluia. So we're gonna go, Alleluia. I feel, use any vocal, you know, timbre you'd like. But we're gonna do that with flick as the gesture, okay? Um, we may go around the room with this, if that's okay, if everybody feels like they do not want to be singled out right now. Just raise your hand or say, mm -mm, not today. Totally fine. want to honor everybody. Um, but we might just take it one by one. Sure. So, Joel, would you mind try and flick with a Alleluia? Sure. If you can. Alleluia. Very good. Do that one more time for me, just so I don't, don't interrupt. Alleluia. Can you see if you can make it even more, so I noticed with flick that it doesn't have legato to it. It's just an accent and then we let go. Mm. Can you see how that might, um, that, that shortness of it, that staccato, might change the way that you sing that phrase? Alleluia. Yes! Different, cool. right? Yeah, oh yeah. Totally different. Yeah. Versus another gesture that we have in the bond called dab. So dab is like you have this little sponge and you're doing a, a sponge painting. Sponge painting. Notice how that has less of a release at the end of it, right? There's, um, you're hitting a um, contact, right? We're dabbing, right? Can you try that, Emily, on an Alleluia or any other vocal cue that I prefer? Alleluia. Very, very nice. Can you imagine this time on the, the L's that they have a little bit more of a maybe a, a pulse to them, or a little bit more, what's the word, marcado feeling to it? Okay, so it's like almost a touching of mm -hmm. the surface, right? Yeah, and even you can imagine touching against my hand, uh -huh. a little pressing, Okay. right? Can you put a little press into the alleluia? Alleluia. Better, very good. Yes, um, there's another gesture called slash. I'm going to try that slash. Uh -huh. You can feel how wild this one is, right? It really gets crazy. Jackie, would you yeah. like to try a little slash with some Alleluia. Oh, oh, I love slash. Slash can be great. Another gesture is ring. Ring. Notice how legato ring is. Notice how much maybe tension can feel in ring, right? We've got some resistance there, right? Um, Larissa, yeah. would you like to try a little ring? Alleluia. Yes, I love the crescendo that we found in that, right? Ring is really great for any time we want to like really lean into legato or re like really lean into a crescendo or driving to the next note, okay? Um, let's try Glide. Mm -hmm. Glide. Now, glide, I want you to think of it as maybe moving through um, mud, right? So it's got some resistance. It's not so totally weightless. Um, Jonathan, is that right? Would you like to try a little glide for me? Alleluia. Oh, yeah. Great legato there, okay? Again, those are great to bring in. Let's do a little float. A little float. Mm -hmm. And 
um, Frank, my, my mentor teacher, would say he likes to start from a low place and then come back up, right? That feeling of kind of circular. Um, what's your name? Oh, Jennifer. Jennifer, <laughs> um, would you like to try a little float for me? Hallelujah. Absolutely. You can see how these gestures really change the way that you sing, okay? We've got one more punch, right? So we've got some punch, 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 punch. What's your name? Michael. Michael, would you try some punch for me? Oh. Any note, any Hallelujah. Yes! a lot of um, specificity to every single syllable that we are using, right? <laughs> Great work, everybody. Take a big hand for yourself. Um, thank you all so much for, for coming and for being here today. Um, just a few final things. Um, listen, I know that this work isn't easy, um, and that's okay. Charlie Chaplin said that it takes courage to make a fool of yourself. Part of the work that we are learning to do is to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. The more we practice being uncomfortable, the less it will feel scary, the more it will actually start to feel like an adrenaline rush. It takes thought. We need to trust the process and do the homework. Students will cut corners if we let them. Be specific, use the worksheets and the handouts I gave you, like Uta Hagen's Nine Questions and the character interview exercise. Um, it takes creativity. Explore all the possibilities. Just really quickly, I have to say, we are rewarding plagiarized performances. I'm seeing it over and over again. I remember at OCU one semester, there were three students who did Christian Chenoweth's version of If You Hadn't But You Did, complete with the exact same choreography in their recitals. As voice teachers, we're letting them do it because it makes us look good, right? We want the best or most hilarious or commercially viable performance we can get, but I think we are doing a huge disservice to our students. We're making them dependent on us or the internet for their creativity, and they're leaving our studio, studios being excellent copycats or imitators instead of learning how to be artists. Which means, leads me to my last concept. It takes you. Doing someone else's performance is the opposite of authenticity. We are each fearfully and wonderfully made. The world doesn't need another Kristen Chenoweth or Joyce DiDonato or Meredith Pyle. It needs each of you. In my humble opinion, it is, there is nothing more important in our work than helping our students explore the depth of their emotions and how that truthfulness can lead to incredible artistry. I hope that some of you were at last night's recital and you were able to witness Joel's stunning performance. As I sat there bawling, it came to me right in that moment that this is what it's all about. This is why we sing. Not so an audience can come be impressed with our work. It's so that they can connect with themselves. It's so they can go, oh, that's how I feel. Thank you for helping me feel that way too. Thank you for giving me feelings for, or thank you for giving a voice to the things that I'm feeling. Thank you for doing what maybe I couldn't do because early in my life I was told that it wasn't okay. If you do that, they're gonna not just be moved, they're gonna keep coming back. They're gonna keep wanting more, they're gonna be your biggest fan and it's gonna make you a star. Singers aren't artists, but they could be. The secret ingredient to that star power is being brave enough to show yourself, all of yourself, because the world needs it and our students need it. So please now go and teach it. Thank you so much. <laughs>
No, no? Yes, thank you. Okay, welcome to this morning's uh, session by Melody Fernandez, a vocal master class for as we zarzuela, zarzuela, what are we going to call this today? However you want to say it. Okay, I was born in Spain, so we're going to say zarzuela and art of song from Spain. Uh, this summer, she was an invited soloist in, an, in a zarzuela um, show concert for LA Opera's simulcast of Aida. As a specialist of Spanish zarzuela, Melody <laughs> has been the lead teaching artist, director, and featured soprano of the LA Opera Zarzuela project since its inception in 2012, and enjoys bridging her passion for zarzuela with her love of teaching. She has been an adjunct music professor at the University of Southern California and Cal State Los Angeles, and has also taught voice at College of the Canyons, earning her Master of Music and Bachelor of Music and Voice from the USC Thornton School of Music. She was a voice fellow at the Music Academy of the West, sang with Opera Pacific for 10 years, and is a member of AGMA and Actors Equity. Please welcome Melody Fernandez. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out today. It's exciting to be here. We have our singers over there waiting, and um, I hope you all have a program. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about zarzuela, or we should be saying zarzuela, <laughs> because zarzuela originated in Spain, where they speak Castilian Spanish. So that includes a lisp for um, most C's or many C's and Z's in their language. So today, the, our singers will be singing Castellano or Castilian. So let me tell you a little bit about zarzuela. It originated in Spain way, way back in the 1600s. There's even some evidence that there was the beginnings of, of zarzuela, but it didn't have a name, um, back in the late 1500s with Lope de Vega and also Calderón de la Barca. And many people believe that uh, Calderón de la Barca wrote the first zarzuela. And um, so zarzuela is a type of music theater. And similar, if you want to kind of liken it to operetta or even musical theater, um, one of the biggest points in zarzuela is that the dialogue is spoken as opposed to being sung or in recitative form uh, as it is done in opera. So because zarzuela comes from plays, zarzuela, it, there was no name for a long time because it was basically incidental music that happened in between the acts of a play or even between the scenes of a play, uh, similar to what Shakespeare was doing. Um, and so it was to allow the actors to be able to change their costumes or change their makeup or for there to be a set change. And so basically there would be a, a song. Um, it could be just the lute by itself uh, or a lute and a singer, and then there was, there, they added more singers. And um, there was also tonadillas that were being um, developed at the same time. But where tonadillas kind of stayed small, um, this other form grew to be larger, included more people, more instrumentalists. And when King Philip IV um, started wanting these uh, musical troops to come and perform at his hunting lodge in, uh, outside of Madrid, um, the lodge was known as La, La Zarzuela. Um, then that's kind of where uh, this genre grew because there was money being put into it. Um, the king enjoyed it and so it started to grow and grow and became its own entity <laughs> uh, known as Zarzuela, and uh, a couple things. Um, uh, the, hunting the hunting lodge of the king was surrounded by these bramble bushes that had little red berries, and I kind of liken them to maybe holly, the holly plant. And, um, and so some people believe that that's where the name Zarzuela came from. Others don't, but I kind of like that story because it kind of makes a lot of sense to me, and especially when um, the hunting lodge was called La Zarzuela, and it's still there. And the, um, the royal family 
uh, lives there, actually. So, um, you all, although you can't go and see it right up front, right up close, you can go to the area, it's just outside of Madrid. So, with Zarzuela, one reason why the king, I imagine the king enjoyed Zarzuela is because uh, it depicted common folk, peasants, uh, farmers, um, people from different countries, even as it, it, it grew, there became a, a mix of characters. And also, it included the nobility, and oftentimes made fun of the nobility. As Sarsuela grew, especially in the 1800s, um, that was kind of the, the golden age of Sarsuela, um, uh, you had nobles coming to see local performances. And there was a good, big mix between the peasants and the locals. Why? Because the peasants were down to earth and fun and, you know, if you know any Spaniards, they like to party. <laughs> and they like to stay up late at night and they love their cerveza and vino. And um, so I can imagine that the nobles and the wealthy people loved engaging with the local folk that were very um, spirited. And uh, if you look at any um, Goya uh, paintings, um, actually they're, they're his tapestries, um, you'll see that these people, they dressed actually really beautifully uh, with mix, a mix of colors and so many different, like a, there's a, there are hair pieces and the men wore stockings uh, and they wore hair pieces as well as the women, uh, hair nets long hair nets with little hanging balls at the end and very elaborate um, and beautiful. And as time passed, <clears throat> the characters developed even more uh, and you have modern characters. So more or less like the last zarzuelas were written in the 1950s. Some people have written some more current zarzuelas, um, more contemporary and those have been performed in Spain. Um, they're not as beloved as, as some of the hits, especially from the 1800s to the 1900s, and the middle 1900s. Um, also in Sarsuelo you have the género chico, which is the small genre, and the género grande. And the género chico, these are the one and two act sarsuelas, and the género grande are more three act, Sarsuelas that are more serious. Um, influences to Sarsuela would be French opera comique. There are dances in every Sarsuela. And in opera comique, there are lots of dances. Also in opera comique, they have spoken dialogue as opposed to sung recitative. And uh, then also the influences of uh, Comedia del Arte because there are lots of comic characters in Sarsuela. Even in the serious zarzuelas, there's always uh, a comic couple, male and female. Um, and then in the, that's for the género grande. And then in the género chico, there's always comic couples, uh, uh, lots of uh, comic characters. And um, time-wise, the smaller, the género chico zarzuelas could be 20 to 30 minutes long. And that includes dialogue. And the Genero Grande Sarsuelas, mm, they're not as long as uh, opera, like a three hour opera, but uh, more like two hours, and that includes dialogue as well. And one thing to note is um, nowadays you can easily get recordings of the Sarsuelas, you can find them easily on YouTube. Um, those are, uh, it's a, YouTube's an, a fantastic resource for Sarsuela. So, um, if you're interested, you know, just Google Sarsuela and see what pops up and just start watching things. Um, I was going to add that, uh, I forgot what I was gonna say, but um, uh, there's the Genero Grande, Genero Chico, and uh, the comic characters, the spoken dialogue, and there's an orchestra, and you see how these things grew from the time of these plays, you know, from a kind of a small little uh, seed that flourished over the centuries to grow into um, 
what we know today and what has kind of stayed the test of time. Many zarzuelas were written haphazardly because of the time they, um, people were so like voracious. They, wa they wanted to see more and more zarzuela, especially Spaniards. They wanted to see their, hear their language and see their people um, in these shows. And uh, especially in the 1800s, well, actually even prior, because King Philip V was, um, he came after King Philip IV, who was the, a patron of the arts and who brought the, the musical troops to his hunting lodge. But King Philip V dealt with depression. And we're still in the 1600s, but now we're in the late 1600s. But he dealt with depression, and he was able to bring uh, Faranelli, or Carlo Broski, to Madrid to be his personal singer. Because when Faranelli sang for him, it pulled him out of his depression. So he ended up hiring Faranelli to basically be the court musician, but he actually was the director of the opera house in Madrid. And although um, this sounds like a wonderful thing, <laughs> and actually it was because it did affect Sarsuela, um, well, he brought in lots of Italians to do the singing and the directing and the stage directing. Um, and whatnot, but that kind of started to overshadow the zarzuela and, and Spanish um, musical culture. But on the other hand, it influenced it. So th that's why some of our zarzuelas have these verismo uh, vocal lines, because they were, the uh, Spanish composers also were um, influenced by Italian composers. So um, you'll see, uh, in your listening of Sarsuela that um, we have the, uh, music that um, might, might seem like a little ditty to things that are very deep. And then we move into Spanish opera. So today, ironically, <laughs> each of our singers is singing a song as, that is um, related to the sea. Um, the three uh, Sarsuela pieces take place in seaside towns. Um, there's a, just this nautical theme running through it, and ironically, with the rain that we've been having, it, it's, it's quite unusual, actually. <laughs> I just realized that coming down here, I'm like, wait a minute. Um, so uh, let's get started with our first singer. We have Antonio, oh no, I'm sorry, Jacob. <laughs> My name is Jacob Alvarez Ruiz. I will be singing Mi Aldea from the Zarzuela Los Gavilanes by Jacinto Guerrero. Mi pecho, 
Wonderful. What a beautiful voice you have. I love your energy. It's really wonderful. Um, I wondered if you could tell us just a little about your song. Yes. Uh, Mi aldea is, as I said before, in the zarzuela Los Gavilanes, which follows the story of Juan, who in his youth had a lover, but then re goes to the Americas. And on his, upon his return, he returns to this maritime town and then sings about the hometown that he thought about night and day and how joyful he is to be back, but this time he's, he's back for good. Um, more about the zarzuela itself? Oh, well, um, I want to add that when he comes back, he's 50. He, when he leaves, he's young, much younger. And he leaves to go um, find riches in Peru. Well, maybe he didn't know he was going to Peru to start with. But he goes to, you know, kind of find riches and um, get, come so that he could come back with money and marry the girl that he loves. So here, at, well, he's 50 years old. He's been dreaming of coming back. But along the way, he had discovered, this is before he got back to Spain, that he, um, that his lover had already married. So that's why he stayed out, away so long. Um, and actually, I believe this one takes place in Pro Provincial. I think, I think so. So it's actually um, takes place in uh, France. Um, as Sarsuelas do, they, they do take place in different locations. <laughs> the majority of them take place in Spain and especially Madrid, but this one doesn't. So he comes back and he's wealthy, right? You come back with jewels. So that interlude, I, I love that you added um, some movement. And that interlude, I feel like you should kind of strut your stuff, mm -hmm. OK? But leading up to it, um, start the song off with uh, more of a, like, here I am, look at me, I'm back, and I've come with riches. They, they show that he has given out some of the jewelry and whatnot that he's brought back to his family, and they're there putting it on and everything. So imagine that. I want to see more coming from your eyes. I hear it in your voice, but there's a little bit of a disconnect. I want you to look out here and see your pictures. Create an inner movie that you are playing out here. See specific things in specific places. So I'm not asking you just to stare or look straight out to the middle, but what do you see over there? What do you see over there? I see, um, I see the old fishermen who I recognize them. They were they were my age when when I left, but the fishermen are now older and they're still doing the same job. Okay, but what's in front of you? In front of me, I see. And let me see it with pictures uh, and colors. That's a, a, a big thing. Add color. I often ask my students to write uh, on a piece of paper like you would a, a set, like set design, okay? And it's their set design for their movie. And you can have multiple, multiple pages, right? Because you have different texts and different sections in your song that might require like, oh, maybe I'm looking out here because I'm seeing my ex crying under a tree. And then over here is the brook that I'm hearing that's in the piano part, say. And then over here, oh, I see us coming together. So. Um, the more detailed you can be, and, and with color, the better. So the, why don't we uh, start the song off? You know, it's declamatory, and you have those higher notes that, that uh, 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 slide down. So make the most of those, OK? And just project your voice out here, and your, uh, send your pictures through your eyes, OK? <laughs> Okay, that was wonderful. Oh my gosh. That was so much more improved. Now you hear that first part that she plays? Can you play that? What does that, what does that sound like to you? Um, it sounds like the horse racetrack. Yeah, moving music, right? So I imagine that you've just come into the scene and you got maybe you 
came to the town square. And think, think of like the world is your oyster. You know, you could buy this entire town and more because you have so much money. Okay, so why don't you start over there? Let's try that. With a sense of urgency. Energize his eyes. Try it again, just that ah. Uh. What's the word on that? Mirar. Mi, oh, mirar, mirar. Mirar. And roll that R, that final R. Mirar. Pensando en ti, noche y día, aldea de mis amores. So now here's where your love of the village, mi aldea's village, here, my village. Um, so. You can just add a little sway, okay? Imagine that it's a woman that you're singing about, or your, your lover, you know? And uh, it has a sexy feel to it, okay? But still keep your eyes lit up, okay? See pictures. That's beautiful. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> uh, we're at time. But you see, um, with just a little bit of poking and prodding, you're able to pull this out of you. What, where we just stopped, you, you're saying that the, the beautiful town that I've dreamt, dreamt of. Let's see that you dreamt it. Ah, oh, okay. Um, beautiful, wonderful work. Thank you very much. And I should add that Los Gavilanes is a three act sarsuela, um, and it premiered in nineteen twenty three. Hello, I'm Jia Yang Zhang, and today I'm going to sing the Blia and Mal. Uh, <laughs> I'm almost just singing this out. <laughs> Sorry. Engaranado from the Zazuela Marina, and I'm going to sing the piece by the Heroic Marina.
Thank you. Very beautiful voice. It fits the song really well. Um, so uh, I, I love the feeling that you're exuding. She is basically lovelorn. And she's, um, uh, um, there's a chorus part that, that um, well, they cut, she cut the section, but, um, which is fine for a solo, in this case, for a solo um, performance. Um, and in the, in the chorus section, they say, wait, girl, um, he'll return. So the, the man that she loves has gone out to sea because, again, it's a fishing village. <laughs> And this is at Costa Brava, which is um, a real place um, on the, the east coast of Spain, around Barcelona and north of Barcelona. And um, <clears throat> so a, a couple things I would like to add is um, you might as well take the high note, the high C at the end of the song. Do you have a high C? Yeah. I bet you do. So. A consolar, a consolar. Okay, so can we start from? Um, oh, actually, we could start on the last page. There are many triplets, mm -hmm. and I didn't hear those triplets. Right there. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can start it at the bottom of um, page, the third page, the second to last page. Oh. Um, Cuando el agua. Cuando el, cuando el agua. And there's the, the little embellishment there. Agua. Okay, so try it again. And a one. And just be careful. Um, the first time through, you slid on Luna. So it, although it seems it's lilting, we never want to slide unless it's written in the music. So for instance, Jacobs has it written where he slides from an octave below, uh, above down oh no, to an octave below. But um, in this case, there's no marking for that. So just be careful with that. OK? Um, how about we start at the bottom system in la in la in la brisa? Mm -hmm. First measure. Our triplets. So you have to keep going back up there. Triplet, triplet, triplet. Okay. Ta 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 ta. Okay. So try that. Just that first measure. Yeah. Vio. Yeah. 
¿Dónde él navega? Allá donde él navega. Or vega. In, Span in Castilian Spanish, the Vs are pronounced as a B. So, um, navega, volando va, okay? So, try it right on that first, what's the second, second measure? The aya. Okay. Aya. the middle a consolar. See how that high note is powerful? It's a fabulous way to end a song. Um, they would do this in, in, within the zarzuela, not just if you're doing it as a solo piece. So um, you have the note, go for it, okay? Now work to understand the text so that we see more reflecting in your eyes and your face. You know the eyes are the windows to the soul. So when you decided to come up here or make singing <laughs> a career path, you decided to open up your soul to not only yourself, but your people, <laughs> okay? So uh, for all my singers, my young singers, work towards getting deeper, a deeper connection to the text, and also see how the piano part relates to the text. Most of the time it does relate to it, so don't ignore it. Um, the two work together. You guys are storytellers, so always continue to work to tell a story. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Jaya. <laughs> An interesting thing about this sarsuela is it started off as, um, I believe, a two-act sarsuela, and then Enrico Tamerlik um, heard it and loved it and encouraged the composer to revise it. So some years later, he, he made it into a three act and it kind of turned it into more into a, an opera. <laughs> and uh, Tamberlick uh, premiered that. He spent so, a lot of time in, in Spain. Hello, my name is Antonio Serrano. <laughs> 
And I will be singing una canción de Manuel de Falla, Olas Gigantes. Beautiful voice, very robust. <clears throat> I kept thinking he was a baritone. <laughs> I kept making mistakes when I was typing the program. <laughs> um, yes, it's a beautiful song by the Falla, Olas Gigantes, Giant Waves. Can you tell us a little bit about the song? So the speaker is asking for a giant wave to just come and just sweep him off the earth. He's asking for this wave to just rip him away and also the memory that causes him so much pain. It almost could be um, seen as a couple of things. You know, there's such fervor in the piano part. You really can feel the waves surging. And, the, you know, the, the dialogue, um, the, the text that's used, I mean, hurricane, um, turbulence, uh, lots of things you can almost imagine that under the sea, uh, spinning ocean, and it talks about the foam being wrapped in the uh, sheets of white foam. Um, and it, it, to me, it has an undertone of this surging love, but also that you've been pushed to the edge. It al almost has a feeling of um, that he's thinking of suicide, right? Um, so I, I love the energy you're giving. Uh, I want to make sure that you're centered and I want you to sing through the phrases a little more. Um, be careful when there is a repeated note on the same syllable. Don't accent that note, but sing through it. So let me see uh, if I can give you an example. Um, and actually, your Spanish is quite good. Be careful with las marchitas hojas. I heard ojos. Hojas, which are leaves. Ojos are eyes. and. Um, we have torbellino, okay? Um, I heard more tor torbellino, uh -huh. okay? So that would be Italian pronunciation with a double L. So torbellino. And um, those are the ones that stood out, but let me find a spot where we can start. Well, we can start, let's start at the beginning, okay? A very good energy, I love that you're projecting. Um, see more definite pictures, okay? And maybe get swept up in it. Oh, 
like this. Imagine that you're on a boat. Uh, you know what, um, in the song that Jia Yang sang, it was also a barcarola. So that is to be with a, 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 sea, a seaside, basically, a seaside rhythm. But now I want you to imagine that you're on this boat. Can, can we just listen to the accompaniment for a minute? More, more um, depth to that. So maybe that inner pulse, da 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 da, da could be your heart. So, like this, you're, you're desperate. So, which way do you think you want to go with this? It's love, deep love that has overcome you. Um, are you on the verge of throwing yourself in the ocean? I like to think about it romantically because it is a source of great pain if, if the person that you love doesn't love you. And at the end of this piece, it says that I cannot bear to be in this pain alone. So please uh, take me with you, wave. So I do think that it is alluding to a, a lover. Mm -hmm. and yeah, also, also they're using the vosotros, which is the personal um, uh, 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 a aspect of, of Spanish, of Castilian Spanish, vosotros. So it's definitely somebody you know well. Um, they're referring to the waves. Take me, take me with you waves. But I think I, I like the idea of taking, you being taken away by this woman. So let's try it. Use that inner pulse from the left hand of the piano, the bass line of the piano, okay? That's your heartbeat. What time is it right now? 10.54. Okay, oh good, okay, great. One more singer, Jeff Wang is doing No Puede Ser from La Tabernera del Puerto, which is a zarzuela by um, Pablo Sorozabal, who's a Basque composer, very prolific. 
And um, go for it. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Jeff Wang. I'm going to say, No puede ser. No puede ser. This is one of the, uh, uh, they call these romanzas, these in, in opera we call them arias, but in Sarsuela we call them romanzas, and this is one of the hits. Um, so you want to tell us just briefly um, who you are and who you're singing to or yeah, about? The character, uh, Leandro, uh, is a young and honestly and, and, and very simple Dutch man. He fell in love with the liquor shopkeeper, Marona, but Marona's father is a drunk dealer. Um, drug dealer. Drug dealer, sorry for my language. <laughs> and maybe her father wanna keep the relationship with the drunk business, so her father don't like Leandro, but Leandro just fall in love uh, with no one in his eyes. She, he just don't believe anyone else, just very simple for enough with Marwana. And nobody knows that the shopkeeper, uh, Juan de Eguia, is Marola's father. They think that he's her husband or lover. And so when they see her um, talking with Leandro, uh, the women in town make fun of her. They, they think that she's, you know, um, trying to come on to their men and such, and so they ridicule her, but they don't know her. Leandro loves her, and in the end, she is the uh, Juan de Guia's daughter. So um, he's saying, it can't be that she's this terrible woman. Why are these people saying these things when I know her to be um, a, a lovely, a, lo a love, she's a love of mine. And um, so in this song, you, you gave a really beautiful interpretation. I would love to see more in your eyes. I want to see more love in your eyes. Um, 
and uh, project your pictures out there. So can we start the beginning? We might have to stop because we're running yes. over. Every time you say no puede ser, you take a little step. No puede ser, da 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 da. da. No puede ser, da 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 da. da. So that there's variances. Yeah, I totally understand. We got carried away. <laughs> so thank you so much. And Jeff, Jeff is a student of mine. <laughs> so can I have all the singers come up on stage really quickly? We can maybe take a group picture. Um, uh, Rob, would you take a picture?
1107 session of uh, the Cal Western Nats. I'm here to introduce Dr. Larissa Calloway, who balances her professional life between the performing arts and teaching. Her PhD research, investigating the role of Pilates in the posture and vocal production of singers, blended her specializations together. Larissa is a conservatory trained musical theater performer who, when not performing, educates in voice and body work pertaining to vocal Alongside her artistry, she is passionate about performing art research and teaching, believing that high quality research supports pedagogical practices, enhances student learning, and champions career longevity. Blending her diverse sources of knowledge, she provides artists with tools to enhance vocal production, body use, prevent and or maintain injuries, and optimize their immaculate health. Oh. <laughs> And she'll tell you how it ends. <laughs> I might if I remember what I write. <laughs> um, now, you'll forgive me. I'm just going to have to escape and have a presenter view because I don't have one, and I hope that that will give me something a little bit different on screen. Uh, ah, I know what I needed to do. Apologies because you don't need to see that version of it, I can assure you. Um, ha, ha, ha. Where is the mirror screen to play? There we are, found the button I want. Marcus, could you assist me? <laughs> Pretty please, because I want to mirror my screen and it won't let me. I need my kids today. <coughs> How would we get by without tech people in our lives these days?
this mirror. Hi, everyone. Apologies for that ridiculously poor tech of me. Um, thank you for coming. Um, and thank you, Nats, the Central Western Divi Region, for my opportunity to present the research today. The embodied voice, the relationship of posture and voice quality attained through Pilates. My name is Larissa Kellaway. I am a performing artist, a singing and mind-body movement teacher. I live in Berkeley, California, but as you have probably guessed, I am an Australian. Um, these are the research findings or a section of my research findings from my PhD research that I completed through Macquarie University, which is a university in Sydney, Australia, um, for which I got my doctorate in 2021. So you're going to have all of my information seen there on the bottom because we can't work it out. Anywho, doesn't matter. I would love to set some background information for you. The Pilates method emerged as the life work of its creator, Joseph Pilates, who was born in 1883 and died in 1967. His New York City exercise gym had its prime years through the 1930s through to the 1960s. And a large proportion of his clientele were drawn from the Broadway performing artists community. Um, he was a German immigrant and he was pretty unrelenting in his approach to mental and physical well-being and he emphasised the two in his writings. He said that physical fitness is the first requisite of happiness. Our interpretation of physical fitness is the attainment and maintenance of a uniformly developed body with a sound mind, fully capable of naturally, easily and satisfactorily performing our many and varied tasks with spontaneous zest and pleasure. Uh, we go. Here we go. So the Pilates principles, uh, sorry, the Pilates technique has six principles which form the foundation of the methodology. They are concentration, control, centering, precision, breathing and flowing movement. I asked a participant who was a part of my research project what these had in terms of the relevance to them as a performing artist and they astutely said to me, so they're everything that you need to be a singer. Joseph Pilates also had a lot of opinions on posture and he identified the relationship between posture and optimal function. He said, good posture can be successfully acquired only when the entire mechanism of the body is under perfect control. Graceful carriage follows as a matter of course. Just as a good smooth running automobile engine is the result of the proper parts correctly assembled so that it operates with a minimum consumption of gasoline and oil with comparatively little wear, so too is the proper functioning of your own body the direct result of the assembled physical fitness reflecting itself in a coordinated unity of body, mind and spirit. This in turn results in perfect posture when sitting, standing or walking with the utilisation of approximately 25% of your energy while the approximately remaining 75% of, in the form of surplus energy is on call to meet the needs of any possible emergency. That, both of those previous quotes come from Joseph Pilates' writing that he co-wrote with William Miller in 1945 called Return to Life Through Controlology. And you'll forgive me, they're his sentences, not mine. And I dare say that the length of some of his quotes are a direct reflection of English being his second language and it definitely reflects his didactic approach. These days, he would have likely been considered unconventional. <laughs> <laughs> or a sadist. Um, <laughs> but regardless of that, Joseph Pilates spoke to the nemesis of the performing artist in this statement, particularly with his remarks of graceful carriage and proper functioning of your own body. Not surprisingly, during my exhaustive background research, I discovered that during his lifetime, many Broadway vocalists referred to him as Joe, and they committed themselves to his tutelage and as part of their singing practice regimes. The artist here is the renowned coloratura soprano Roberta Peters and she went on to teach in a conservatory and also published some research papers and she said in one of those, I believe in physical fitness and strengthening the diaphragm through exercise. I exercised at a gym under the supervision of Joseph Pilates who has taught dancers and singers a special system of strengthening all parts of the body. So she was identifying him as the key to her strength and I don't think I could cope with someone doing that to me and I've been doing Pilates for 25 years. <laughs> um, 
Some other vocalists who were part of his clientele included Maria Callas, Jose Ferreira, Oscar Calcare, and Rissé Stevens. The Pilates equipment was all developed and patented by Joseph Pilates. And furthermore, he was also known to create specific equipment to meet client needs in particular. So the one here that Roberta Peters is using is called the Aero Mill. And Joseph Pilates in the article that was in Time Mag sorry, Life magazine about this particular, um, the artist itself, he was quoted as saying that she could push more air through the Aero Mill on the dial than anybody else in the studio, including him. And the pedipole that's on the other side of that slide is something that he developed for Rissé Stevens to assist her with her breathing. I would suggest knowing what the equipment does. It's probably got something to do with assisting her with her back posture and her latissimus dorsi and erector spinae strength. Posture and singing. So, the lovely Ingo Tietze and his co-author Abbott say that a noble posture is important for singing and it's actively encouraged by most singing pedagogues. Um, good posture is equated with improving the ease of singing, access to your breath, uh, maintaining good vocal quality and vocal health, in addition to improving some of the aesthetic look that you have. Posture refers to the orientation and state of the bones, ligaments, tendons and muscles in static and dynamic motion. And you'll note I say motion. I don't say static. <laughs> Um, it's incorrect to think of the body as being completely still at any point in time because even during quiet breathing, we have movement at the rib cage. So if you think about the interaction of the ribs with the spine and then also with the sternum, every breath that comes in and out, they interact slightly to allow the inhalation to come in and the exhalation to come out. If they didn't, we wouldn't get any air in. They also have to move to allow for the diaphragmatic contraction to go up and down as well. This statement from the Posture Committee of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons quite succinctly um, identifies what posture really is. Posture is usually defined as the relative arrangement of the, good, of the parts of the body. Good posture is that state of muscular and skeletal balance which protects the supporting structures of the body against injury or progressive deformity, irrespective of the attitude erect, lying, squatting, stooping, in which these structures are working or resting. Under such conditions, the muscles will function most efficiently and the optimum positions are afforded for the thoracic and abdominal organs. Poor posture is the relationship of the various parts of the body which produces increased strain on the supporting structures and in which there is a less efficient balance of the body over its base of support. So in this picture here, we're looking at posture in the side on and in the back. And I'm probably not telling you something you don't already know, but it's always good to come back and remind ourselves of what a supposed ideal looks like. Um, so we refer to posture looking at it from a reference plumb, plumb line, which is a suspended string that is weighted down to the floor. And we start from the bottom and come up. So in the lateral view, which is looking at it from the side, we would be seeing that line pass from slightly in front anterior to the lateral, mal lateral mal malleoli. Goodness me, anyone would think I'm not a singer and I can't actually speak. Um, the lateral malleoli and the central axis of the knee. So the malleoli is that bony bit on the side of your ankle if you're not good on anatomy. Then it comes up slightly back of the central axis of the hip. It passes internally through the bodies of the lumbar vertebrae and at that area should have a gentle concave curve. It'll go through the midpoint of the shoulder. It'll do the same thing in the neck area where it passes through the central bodies of the cervical spine, the neck bones. And then it'll pass through the center of the ear canal and be slightly posterior to the apex of the coronal suture. Um, in the posterior view, we look at it and we can see that that plumb line passes equally right between the middle of the heels up through the middle of the knees. Then it'll bisect the body into two. It's also called the mid-sagittal line. And that will put our, right through the middle of our pelvis on the sacrum, up through each of the spinous processes and all the way through the centre of the neck before we leave out the top of the head. So you can't sit down for the whole hour because you'll all go crazy. And actually, you're not even going to be here for a whole hour anyway. Please stand up. Say hi to the person next to you. Um, and if you want, 
take some space out here because you might actually find it a little easier to have a bit of distance to be able to view somebody that you're working with. So I would just like you to take the opportunity to actually visualise these landmarks on a body and have a look and see what they look like. So you do need to be with somebody. This is not about you saying to that person, no, um, do say hello, that'd be a good start. <laughs> Um, actually, if you do have heels on and it's not a big drama to take them off, take them off. Um, in fact, take your shoes off, period, male or female, non-binary, whatever, you just be in your flat feet. It's much better for your posture generally. In fact, I love that Adina Menzel came out onto the stage at the Sydney Opera House a few years ago in this stunning black gown and no shoes. And everybody in the audience was going, what's going on? And she proceeded to say that she didn't perform in shoes anymore after having a back injury and her Pilates instructor told her not to. <laughs> so, have a look at these landmarks on a body. Don't use it as an opportunity to say anything about that person's posture. This is purely and simply for you to be able to say, can I actually see those landmarks on another body? Take a couple of minutes and look at each other and we'll come back again in a minute. Visualize that line side on and back on. a whole other conversation. All right, you can come and sit back down again. No, no, but feel free to leave them off. I don't really mind. <laughs> so I would like to point out that I just said to you, don't try and correct your posture. I would also like to point out that it's highly unlikely that any of you in this room are actually in particularly good posture at this point in time. You've either flown or driven or come from somewhere. You've probably slept in a bed that's not yours, with a pillow that's not yours, and you've sat in a chair all day. All of those things are going to impact posture. And, yeah, and it's something that also needs to be taken in consideration is what are your loads during your day? You know, gravity is going to play a part. It's going to drag you down. It's going to do things to you. You're going to carry a heavy bag. You're going to have things that are going on in that regard. So posture is not 
a static thing. It will change from day to day in response to all of those things. And then it's also affected by physiological conditions and disease. We have to consider posture in multiple aspects as well. So we can't just think about posture in standing, we have to think about posture in motion. So posture is affected by and should be impacted by our locomotory and also our work-related tasks. In locomotion, if we're talking about walking, we could also be referring to running or jogging, or if we're talking about using a non-motorised -mecha non mechanical object, such as a scooter or a bicycle, those things will create habits towards the way that we use our body and then that will impact our more stationary postures and our moving postures. So I'll give you an example. Someone who sits at their desk most of the day, most of every hour, but only moves between desks, is going to have a very different postural presentation to somebody who stands up as part of their job. Um, the other thing that needs to be thought about in terms of posture is what is their work-related task look like? and this will bring us into the world of singing in a second, but think about a dentist. Dentist spends a really large amount of their day leaning over a person with their hands in their mouth. Don't understand why anyone would want to do that job. And <laughs> have, have to look in and see, and all of those things as a movement practitioner and as an allied health practitioner, we will see those in their postural habits and their presentation of the way they function. Um, the other thing that we see, and this is important when we start to bring it into the world of performing artists, is that people who play instruments, the, particularly those that have got a symmetry with them, they will also show up in their postural presentation. So if you've got a flautist or a guitarist who's also a singer, they're going to have a harder time. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> um, so singing performing artists, are definitely impacted by their work-related movement. I will caveat to say this, that I work in the space of musical theatre performers, so I am kind of on that vein, but don't discredit this from other um, singing genres because it's very important. <coughs> so the work that these people will do will not necessarily impact their habit because it's not always necessarily the same, but it will have impacts in terms of that need for the strength to be able to deal with it. I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So take an example, a performer who is doing, say, some shorter tracks, um, shorter seasons, sorry, so they're doing three to four different tracks in a year and the various different choreography and blocking demands of that, are highly likely to see long-term postural um, impacts in the way that they carry themselves. But that doesn't necessarily mean that their strength isn't going to be impacted or have demands placed on it. Um, the other thing is that the difference between what they do on the stage and what they do in normal day-to-day -day life actually usually don't have a huge amount of similarity and crossover. So, you know, I'll give you a classic example. I don't know many people who climb up onto the barricades, stand on a pretty unstable surface and start waving a French flag in their right arm <laughs> as part of their day-to-day -day activity. But they have to be ready to meet that demand. And so this is where we might describe them as needing to have show fitness. So we need to be able to identify how to have good posture in terms of technical requirements, but we also have to be ready to meet the musculoskeletal demands placed on us as performing artists in our day-to-day -day lives as performers and also in our normal routine. So with that in mind, it does warrant considering the implementation of adjunct training practices into the practices that happen with performing artists. Um, obviously, some of those are definitely met by our artistry-based activities, such as our singing lessons, our dancing lessons, our acting lessons, and various other things that we might do in each of those genres. But if we look at the model that they use in sports performance enhancement, and we apply that to the singing practice, it does warrant looking at what other things that we can bring in in terms of the mindfulness and the somatic movement practices. Um, so in some tertiary training programs that is actually, and also some singing teaching practices and acting teaching practices, those things have been integrated. And things like Alexander Technique, Feldenkrais, uh, mind-body centering, Pilates, have been integrated and brought into it. And whilst Pilates does feature on the list, along with those other things, very little in the way of research that actually substantiates their inclusion has been done. So, 
also looking at the examination of the literature about Pilates, it's been shown to have a role in postural presentations and correction of poor postural habits and control of the posture. In addition to that, it's also been shown to impact and improve a variety of conditions such as breathing. In terms of volume and strength, it's also been shown to improve core muscular strength or your, um, your lumbo, dynamic lumbopelvic stability. Um, it's been shown to have a role in exercise rehabilitation programs for lower back pain, for knee pain, for ankle pain. It's had some action in um, pelvic floor dysfunction. And it's also been shown to impact well-being and mental health. So with all of those things that I knew about Pilates, it made me go, why don't we use it in singing enough? So at the commencement of my research, when I started looking at things, I had a look to see how much had been published about Pilates in relation to singing or actually to the broader performing arts, and there was very little published. In fact, if I thought about it, Pilates has been used in the dance community for dance community for decades, but it didn't have very much academic literature to support its use. And whenever I went and spoke to anybody at a conference, they'd usually go, oh, no, Pilates. Well, I don't do that. <laughs> um, and I didn't understand that. So my research questions then were, does the regular practice of Pilates in, by singers impact their posture? And does that participation of Pilates, in Pilates have any impact on their singing voice? So what you'll see today is a small part of my PhD findings, um, which is looking at the postural changes and the uh, intersection with the vocal quality. I was extremely fortunate to be able to work, work with performing artists between 2015 and 2016 who were drawn from the musical theatre community in Australia, either in professional touring companies or those that were professional and student artists that resided in Sydney where the research was conducted. The project was designed in two phases. So stage one represented the short-term findings and stage two was the longitudinal findings. In stage one, I had 32 artists and in, then nine of those people continued on to stage two. Um, so how I went about doing this is that I put out an advertisement to the various different places that you can source singers from, ANATS, which is the Australian National Association of Teachers of Singing, um, and theatre companies and various voice teachers and also through social media. And people who were interested, I initially screened them by phone to determine their suitability. Um, those people who were considered to be suitable had to be someone who had had at least two years of professional level experience and or training, who had had no Pilates experience over the last five years, and that had no pre-existing or conditions, injuries or conditions that would have impacted the results or even participation. They were informed of what was gonna happen, invited to join the study, and all of the people were asked to provide consent in line with the Macquarie University ethics requirements. I ended up, oh, I should just go back to that for one second. From there, what happened was that they came into my little space at Macquarie University, provided me with some recordings of vocal samples, and we conducted a postural assessment on them, and they completed a questionnaire just to garner what they thought about the world of Pilates and also what their singing practice habits were like, what their movement and exercise practices were like as well. Then I went to, they went into a studio setting where they were taught Pilates in a group scenario. So this is um, no more than 10 people in a class. All the classes were fully designed to meet the needs of a performing artist and they were fully supervised and taught by yours truly. And then after that, they came back and they recorded the vocal samples again. They had another postural assessment and they completed a open-ended questionnaire. Uh, sorry, open-ended interview with me. And then those that went on to stage two, the process was exactly the same, but where it differed was that instead of them being in a group Pilates class, they were now taught one-on-one -on -one and across the entire repertoire of equipment as well. So my demographics of my participants are shown here in this table, and I, <laughs> there were more women than men, uh, birth assigned women and compared to birth assigned men. Uh, and most of it was about a split three ways between performing artists who were full-time, part-time and students. A large proportion of them were musical theatre artists. I had a few that were not. Um, and for the most part, they pre the women, because I've got so many women, this is why this happened, but they were mostly mezzo-sopranos in the group and then the spread was across the rest of it. 
they were asked to self-identify their voice type. That's not me deciding on how they sing, that's how they describe themselves. When you conduct a research study where you're looking at vocal production parameters, it's actually extremely difficult to use a control group. You actually can't really easily do that because everybody's voice footprint or thumbprint is very unique to them. So because of that, we decided to use a within subject design where the individual served as their own control. That's why they did the pre-vocal samples and pre-postural assessment and then came back and did it again at the end. All the data points were recorded pre and post and then they were assessed for change. So change was determined as, as follows here in this chart where I would look and see if there was change, yes or no. And then I would also look to see whether that um, parameter had a positive or a negative impact on what they were trying to do. So just because someone had a no positive didn't mean that Pilates had been bad, but rather that Pilates hadn't done anything for them in terms of what they needed, or they already started at a high level. Um, now that's completely in line with the phenomenon in the sports um, enhancement and sports conditioning where you get what's called diminishing returns where when you start off and you're working with someone who's very deconditioned and very poor quality movement patterns, their changes are rather rapid and then they taper out and plateau and then the changes become much smaller and much more difficult to distinguish. Um, is there anything else I need to say there? No. So, postural outcomes first. I had 45 key postural traits and um, markers and between 13, 11 and 13 vocal quality measures that I looked at um, at the beginning and then at the end of the Pilates program. And as you can see in this pie chart, Pilates was positively impacted in 91% of the participants. Um, of that, 60 were directly related to their involvement in Pilates and 31% of them maintained their pre-existing condition. The yes negative in this instance um, is that they moved away from something that we would be considering to be good posture and I'll talk about that in a moment and the no negative means that they needed to change and they didn't. <laughs> um, there's a limited amount of research that has shown that the positioning of the head and neck can directly impact vocal production. So I was actually quite interested in this area and narrowed into that area in terms of my results. And as you can see here, over 50% had a change in the structure of their cervical spine positioning and about a third of them had a position difference in the way they place their head. So I'm just gonna come around here. And so what I'm looking Um, overall, say it again. Oh, somebody had some. I love murmurs from the wall. Please speak up if you want to contribute to the discourse. Um, overall, looking at the head and neck posture area, we saw that uh, there was a change in what's my mathematics on this one now? 62% of the people, but 6% of those didn't need any change, and the other 56 did present with some changes to that area. I want to say a little bit about the no negative now, and the yes negative actually, more so than the no negative. So the no negative doesn't necessarily mean that everything's bad. What happens with posture is that it's a rearrangement of what's going on. And so sometimes what you have, and particularly in a study and a time window of 12 weeks that I had here, we haven't had enough time for the changes to all integrate and to actually occur throughout the entire organism. So in this instance, and I will say you know, very specifically about some of the participants, some of them came in not great and needed a lot of correction. When you look at their overall data, they had really positive attributes achieved in some areas, but it didn't always mean that it was across the board. Um, the sagittal spinal posture, which is now taking the whole picture of the side of the spine, showed that 72% of the participants demonstrated a positive outcome to that, with their spinal curves being restored to the ideal. Now, why that's important is that we need that curvature in our spine to actually deal with balancing loads and also for shock absorption to protect against injury. 
Um, the largest amount of that change occurred in the cervical spine posture and then followed by the thoracic area and then the lumbar area. Dynamic lumbar pelvic stabilization is the medical term that we use. Core stabilization is what the fitness industry used. Pilates has been shown to impact that area quite significantly and all of the participants in my research study developed better lumbar pelvic stabilization under load. In fact, nearly all of them, there are some gold standard measures that you use, nearly all of them were over 75% functional and not all of them started there. Some of them couldn't even engage it when they came in. Um, the other things that I looked at were in terms of shoulder orientation and mobility, hip control and mobility and orientation and spinal flexibility. Um, noteworthy gains were seen in the hip joint in terms of the ability to control the single leg stance and that's huge in terms of locomotion. So if you're thinking about people who are musical theatre performers who are dancing on the stage, they need to have really good single leg stance control and it also has a huge impact on preventing injury downstream at the knee and the ankle. The other things that were really significantly impacted were shoulder orientation was significantly improved and spinal flexion was also significantly improved. Moving on to vocal outcomes, cumulative across the three sample tasks that I asked them to do, which were to sing a sustained note, to sing me happy birthday, <laughs> and to sing a, about a minute's worth of a song of their own choice. They were the three tasks that we chose. Um, vocal production was impacted in 91% of the participants following Pilates. Uh, there was about 24 of them, so about 75% who developed it as a result of Pilates and five who were already there when they came in the door. Um, no negative outcomes in terms of yes, negative occurred, but there were three that really could have done with having some slightly better vocal production and that didn't happen. Um, vocal parameters were examined via a spectrogram and we were looking at things like the overall waveform characteristics, we were looking at onset and offset, uh, format presentation. What was fascinating to me is that offset was basically unchanged. It never, there was no difference in that at all in terms of their habitual behaviour, but it really didn't need it either. So these were representing singers who were very skilled. Um, onset behaviours, though, were modified in about 50% of participants in the sustained note task, but unchanged, despite re needing change in the song task. Um, so to come a little off script, one of the things that we think, or I think, was going on in that regard is that when a student is learning a piece of work, that the habit gets grained in right then. So if we don't get it right at that point, it's really hard to break it, regardless of what you have done with them in terms of postural alignment. So you know, I've seen some really fascinating and very important presentations from Travis, who's here right now, and also this morning from, help me, who was that this morning? Then? Meredith, and you know, talking about the process that we go through when we actually work with a student to start to have them learn something. And it really highlights the need to make sure you get it right the first time um, because it's difficult to break. And also to break away from any of the habits that they might have from hearing it from another artist who's recorded it that's been drilled into their head. Um, the singer former cluster um, and apologies for anybody who gets, starts to glaze over in when it comes to um, voice parameters and physics. Uh, the, is the clustered third, fourth and fifth formants uh, that sit across the 2500 to 3500 hertz region. It's a particularly useful tool to assess a male voice and I know that you pro some of you will be sitting there going, why did you use this technique? But it's actually still proved to be very useful with this particular study. Um, it's not especially useful for sopranos, but I didn't have very many sopranos, so that's one of the reasons why we decided to use it. Uh, and we saw that in across the three singing tasks, 70% of them were dramatically improved in the singer's formant, um, but also we saw that there were some that had a high proportion of yes negative, again, in the no task. And, and that was fascinating to me because I, most of them looked at me and said, why do I have to sing a sustained note? Oh yeah, okay, ah, uh, I'm like, great, thank you. <laughs> um, I looked at vibrato rate and regularity. 
And we can see that a large proportion of the singers improved in rate and regularity across the three tasks. Um, and then the other thing that I looked at was straight tone. Not every singer used straight tone, um, but for those that did, they were also dramatically improved. So one of the, when I looked at that on the actual waveforms, what you would see is that people who were in, had a tendency to use straight tone didn't have stability in it. But once they had done the Pilates, it was a rock solid line. There was no movement in it whatsoever. So it was very exciting from that perspective. The belt people in the room would be jumping up and down with the joy at this point. So the next thing was to say, okay, well, that's great. They've got better posture and they've got better vocal quality. What's the relationship between the two? So if you were to just take a visual look at this graph, what you want to see is that you sit down in that bottom left-hand corner which means that you've had either a positive change from in both of those areas, posture and in vocal quality, or in one or of the other, and you maintained where you were before. And the proof is in the diagram. They, most of my singers came away having one or both of those things changed, and that they were definitely related to one another. Um, in their post-test interviews, I also asked the singers a lot of things in regard to their qualitative experience, like how did this feel for you? And what I then took was that information about what they thought they had achieved and they compared it against what they actually had achieved in terms of their quantitative data. And again, same thing, they want to sit down in that bottom left-hand corner and a very large proportion of my singers actually achieved that. So those people who perceived that they were doing better vocal production, they felt like they could sing better, mostly were. And there's also, I was interested to see how they felt about their skills as a singer. You know, do I feel more comfortable with that, being able to do what I need to do now? And how does that compare to their vocal production? And again, a large proportion of them, more than half, had that phenomenon occur for them. Um, that's where I want to take you on a slightly different hook, and you probably didn't expect this part of the discussion. A singer's perception of their ability to be able to do their work and their capabilities is a di directly impacts how their psychological well-being is going. And with more than half of the singers feeling like they had better trust in their voice and that they felt like that they had a better instrument, their performing skills were actually enhanced. Um, so where this starts to then come into line is where you say, okay, well, let's have a look at that against the literature and see what they've got to say. And it seems that if we, when I examine the literature, that this is creating a space where they can fall into flow state. So if you're familiar at all with any of the concepts that have been developed by the researcher Sixman Mahali, he talks about flow state as being the ideal p condition for you to be in, where that you are in a position in your mind where the challenge that you are trying to do matches your skill set, but it's not that it's too easy and you feel bored, but it's also not too hard and it's not out of your grasp. And he says of flow that a person in flow is in control of his actions and of the environment. While involved in the activity, this feeling of control is modified by the egoless state of the actor. Rather than an active awareness of mastery, it is more a condition of not being worried by the possibility of lack of control. So overall, what it's suggesting, what the findings are suggesting from Pilates is that it didn't only improve their instrument, but it psychologically impacted their belief system and that that then led them to be in a condition where they were much more conducive to being in flow state and that they've had the experience of being better equipped to facilitate the task that was being asked of them at that point. I bring that up because that sort of aligns with some of those things that we talk about of being in the moment when we have singers who come away and they're like, I don't have any idea what happened from the start to the finish of that, I just know I had a really great time. <laughs> we want our singers to get there, that they really are selfless in the process and that they're not being self-aware and they're not watching themselves. So, I hope, oh, and I made it in the time frame too. Um, I hope that you have found out something you didn't know. Um, these are a very small proportion of my PhD findings, but they do present compelling evidence to suggest that Pilates has a place in the training regimes of singing practice, singing performing artists in terms of their practice and also in their training programs. 
Um, they are, there was a study that was published in 2019 and my findings are exactly in line with that it's a much smaller study that happened in Spain by Mezzadini as well. Um, and what the key findings of my research that I presented for you today were that their singer's postural presentation is positively impacted from participation in Pilates, as is their vocal production, and that Pilates demonstrates almost no negative impacts on vocal quality and posture in singers. And that's probably one of the most important things, is that if you gave them Pilates, you're not going to do any harm. Um, also that most of the singers in this study demonstrated a postural presentation and vocal production that were positively impacted and that the two events are directly related to one another and that they perceived a, a qualitative, qualitative improvements and this related directly to their measurable quantitative gains. So my study and also Mesodemi really suggest that there needs to be an ongoing investigation into with much bigger numbers and across much diverse populations, you know, looking at people who are working as Broadway artists as compared to classical artists as compared to people in choral environments and also in different cities and different locations and conditions. But that the correlation between psychological well-being, Pilates participation and also the vocal and postural benefits has far-reaching implications for these, po this population as well as the wider community. And it definitely suggests that we can, should continue to investigate other adjunct mind-body modalities, not just Pilates, and to really determine what their benefits are and whether they should be included or not into <laughs> program design and um, structure of curriculum. Uh, what did that do? This is my slide of references, which you can ask me for. <laughs> and I hope that you found this provocative and interesting and insightful. Um, and I really hope it contributes to your ongoing scholarship. If you've got any questions, throw them at me for the last four minutes. 